Hi everyone, it's Emmeline here and I'm a wildlife biologist and science communicator and I'm back on another nature trail. This time I'm at Upton Towers Nature Reserve and I'm with Andy Nelson who is a people engagement officer for the Cornwall Wildlife Trust and part of the Dynamic Dunescape project. That's right. And we are at the Upton Towers Nature Reserve, but it's actually a sand dune nature reserve, so a little bit of a different one this time. So we're going to walk around and see what wildlife we can find along the way. Hey, so that caterpillar we were just looking at, that looked like the cinnabar moth caterpillar, didn't it? I think so, yeah. yeah. Orange and black stripes all yeah. along the body and very closely associated with ragwort and ragworts are quite common on the dunes here so it's quite tall i think it kind of looks quite raggedy which is how i help, yeah. helps me to remember the name yeah um and it produces yellow flowers which yeah. are a really good source of nectar for lots of invertebrates so from a from an invertebrate point of view it's, it actually supports lots of species yeah. or helps to support lots of species the dunes are very important for all the inverts we've, we've already been seeing quite a few haven't we and we've only yeah. been here about 10-15 minutes. So there's still quite a few pyramidal orchids around. Um, we were thinking that it might be a little bit too late on in the year but we've just seen a few now and they're absolutely beautiful, beautiful flowers, beautiful orchids and a particular fact about this species is that the seeds of this plant don't have enough nutrients to grow themselves so they actually rely on a fungal mat in their um, root system to grow and to thrive. Down here you've, you've got an area that's quite flat. It's obviously been modified. This would have been when there was the explosives factory, which was the sort of late 1800s, early 1900s. Yeah. Uh, that, was, that was here for about 30 years, something like that. And the whole site actually is now a scheduled monument because of that historical link, this explosives factory that was um, producing stuff for mining and also for the Navy, for the big guns on the Navy ships. Right. So you see all these kind of straight lines and flat bits and angular bits in the dunes where the, the landscape has been modified. Yeah. Um, so you have sort of uh, areas where they've sort of cut through for pipelines, areas where they've flattened bits of the dunes. Yeah. And they've also built sort of square or rectangular dunes around where some of the buildings were as a way of limiting the impact of explosions. Right. So it was quite a high risk explosives factory, you know. Um, so if a building happened to blow up, having it surrounded by the dunes was a really good way of limiting the impact. Hopefully only that building went rather than the next one and the next one. Right. The next one. We're also seeing some beautiful ladies' bed straw in bloom, another wonderful plant. Um, and it's actually the food plant of the small elephant hawk moth, which has also been spotted around this area. So hoping we can come across one today, hopefully if we're lucky enough. Um, and historically, bed straw has quite a few uses. Um, it actually apparently used to be dried and used to stuff mattresses, hence the name. And ladies' bed straw in particular was actually also used to curdle milk for cheese. That was a really exciting find. Basically had like whole example of the life cycle of the six spot burnet moth there had the caterpillars and then the cocoon and then one that had uh, or the leftover of one that had emerged from the cocoon as well so that was really really cool to see wow well, yeah there's one called carline thistle oh i haven't seen is, that before it's um it kind of so it's associated with dry soils right so it's sort of coming it looks the one i saw was nearly out i think it's july to september yeah um, and they kind of look they're interesting because they kind of look dead they look like dead daisy or something but right. that's just what they look like oh wow um so they are i think they are coming out around about now i'm seeing lots of wild thyme around and it's the first time i've actually seen it so it's really exciting um but yeah we were just speaking about the rabbits weren't we yeah so, so you find the wild thyme in these really short grazed areas yeah. these sort of lawns if you like or, or t uh, areas of short turf and without the rabbits we wouldn't have these really short areas yeah, so exactly. it's re they're really important with when it comes to the whole diversity in the dune system these smaller lower growing plants really rely on these areas so again as we're walking around we're just coming across so many more plants there's lots of eye bright around as well which is a beautiful little white flower and andy was saying that it usually grows around areas where there's thyme 
as well, which obviously we've been seeing a lot of. And we've also been lucky to see lots more cinema moths as well and lots of soldier beetles as well. So yeah, it's really wonderful to see just all the diversity within the area. So can you tell me a little bit more about the dune formation, just the whole process? All the sand that's formed these has all blown up from the beach. So yeah. it's basically, it's been dumped by the sea and then as the tide recedes and it dries out, sometimes if the wind's blowing the right direction, the wind will blow some of that sand up yeah. um, in a landward direction. Yeah. And then what happens is when the wind kind of encounters something like an object, an obstruction or some vegetation, that slows the wind down, the wind deposits the sand. Right. Now, if plants get a chance to start growing in those small, what we, we call embryonic dunes, yeah. then those dunes can grow and get bigger and bigger, and those those plants basically bind the sand together. Right. That's when you get your dunes start, starting to form. The Dynamic Dunescapes project, which I work on, yeah. has been set up because there are concerns that a lot of dune systems, and not, not every dune system, um, but a lot of dune systems in Europe are getting really thickly vegetated. Yeah. So those sort of more mobile, more dynamic areas of the dunes are being lost. Some of the big work that we're doing is getting heavy machinery in, like diggers and bulldozers and all that kind of stuff that looks quite scary. Yeah. Um, but the idea is to do work, like here we've got a, a dune slack wetland area mm -hmm. um, that's getting quite thickly vegetated. So we're gonna scrape some of it back. So scrape right. the surface off, uh, and then that kind of rejuvenates that dune slack, that kind of wet area. So we create space for other species that are less competitive, some of these lower growing ones, some of the, what we call early succession species. So as we're walking around, there's a lot of dog walkers around the area, isn't there? So we've seen a lot of free running dogs and things like that, obviously over this reserve habitat. Um, can you tell me some of the ways that Cornwall Wildlife Trust and the Dynamic Dunescape Project are trying to encourage dog walkers to also help wildlife especially at this reserve yeah sure yeah. it's a great place to come and walk your dog it's a beautiful area to do that yeah. um, uh, but there are some issues that can occur um, so for example if people uh, don't pick up their dog poo yeah that acts as a kind of a fertilizer so yeah. uh, we might think fertilizer is good for plants but actually Sand dune plants are typically that they you know they've evolved in these quite nutrient poor conditions. Yeah. So if we were to add fertilizer, the, the dune specialists get outcompeted by your more sort of generalist plants. We actually end up with things like more nettles and brambles and things that you can find lots of other places. Other things people can do is just be aware that uh, we have ground nesting birds such as skylarks and meadow pipits in the dunes, and yeah. they love to to nest in the marram grass for example and obviously we get lots of marram grass on the dunes especially sort of april to august when we these, these birds they're they're making the nest in the ground that you know they've got their eggs and their chicks yeah. and dogs especially when they're free running can disturb the birds and can have an impact on the success of their breeding so it's something you can do is kind of learn more about these species and appreciate when it's perhaps good to have your dog off a lead and when it's good to have your dog on a lead. Yeah. Some beautiful sea holly here and it's actually called sea holly because of what the leaves look like. They have, resemble holly leaves but it's not actually closely related to the holly, it's more closely related to carrot funnily enough. Um, and the leaves or just the plant in general has a waxy coating and this helps this species to retain water especially in the more drier kind of environment it's growing and a really interesting fact is that the roots of the sea holly in the elizabethan era actually used to be sugared and sold as sweets so thank you for watching this nature trail i hope you enjoyed it we found so many cool species along the way so huge thank you andy for taking me along on this trail it was really really interesting to learn all about the dunes and everything like that so yeah but as usual keep a look out for more nature trails to come and keep safe on your wild walks and i'll see you all again soon bye, bye.